Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is set not on divine things, but human things. Get behind me, Satan. If you're from the South, you know that that's a common expression in the South for all kinds of things. Uh, one is if you are tempted to eat that second piece of cake, then you say, get behind me, Satan, so you can resist that second piece of cake. Of course, in Lent, we got to do it on the first one so that we don't do the first piece of cake. Reminds me of this woman who bought this very expensive dress and came home and showed her husband. Husband saw it and said, you know, we can't afford this right now, dear. Why did, why did you buy it? And she said, well, the devil made me do it. I tried it on and it looked so good on me, I just had to buy it. And he said, well, why didn't you say, get behind me, Satan? She said, well, I did. But he said it looked good from back there, too. <laughs> get behind me, Satan. What does that mean? What do we mean when we talk about Satan? See, this is a very important thing. As I've grown in my understanding of things, I've, I've, I've begun to understand that the word Satan or the idea of Satan is really a, an externalization or a projection of an aspect of what we call our ego. Uh, the ancient people didn't understand the interiority of things in those days. They had to project things out. And this, the ego is a great thing to have, obviously. We can't, can't operate without it. But it only knows by separating things. And some of the things it separates are not so good for us, and that's kind of what we call Satan. For instance, we separate our minds from our body and soul and try to live in our minds. Uh, this makes us feel alone and separate and isolated and fear just kind of takes over. But rather than kind of coming in together in relationship, what it does is makes us feel separate but superior to others. Now, believe it or not, that is the basis of religion in Jesus' day. The leaders of Israel thought of themselves as separate and superior. That's what they called holiness. They were wealthy and they had separated themselves from the poor. They were healthy and they had separated themselves from the sick. And they could follow the law because they had time to follow the law. Uh, everybody else didn't, time and money. And so they separated themselves from everybody else, which they called sinners. They were seeing themselves as separate, but superior, but also godly, holy. Now, Peter was poor and probably considered a sinner because he didn't have the money to pay for all the stuff that you needed to do to be uh, uh, restored to right life and so forth. But he believed this malarkey too. It was the devil of an idea, you see, to think of yourself as separate and superior. That way, you know, you're in control of your life and control of everything. So when Jesus, when Peter calls Jesus Messiah, that's what he's thinking about. He's thinking about being separate and superior, that, that Jesus is going to be this one who is use whatever means possible. It may have to be a, a battle or a revolution or whatever, but he'll rise to the top and Peter will rise with him. James and John feel the same way. It's a devil of an idea. Now, before we get too down on them, you have to know this is our default position too. <laughs> this is the way we are, that we think this way as well. And you have to be told not to think this way, not to think this way. You really do. You think about how we might think of in our, in our own life of being wealthy. And it doesn't mean just being real wealthy. It just means being an American, being, you know, wealthy in terms of the world. And we think about all the people that are out there that are poor and suffering as not being as good as us, as being inferior. That's the default position. You have to be told that's not the truth, you see. And that's what religion is supposed to do, is tell you not the truth. Tell you the truth about what things are, that we're all the same, that we're all one together. But that isn't what we always get. 
even in religion. We call it the gospel of prosperity or the success gospel. Very prevalent, especially among televangelists, but also everywhere. Um, doesn't include Billy Graham, but it does include lots of folks. Oral Roberts, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, Benny Hinn. Uh, my favorite or the one that I was able to, to study was Kenneth Copeland. After I graduated from seminary, I began to look at some of the words that these televangelists were saying so I could figure out what their message was and why everybody was following them. And Kenneth Copeland was great at this. He would say, God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. And he would look at the Old Testament, and there are all kinds of passages about God wanting prosperity for people and so forth, and you see it everywhere. And then he would go to Mark 10. This is a couple of chapters past where we are right now in our gospel. And he takes it out of context, and you'll have to read it to see what it's really saying. But, but he says, Jesus says, and this is what Jesus says, Jesus says that if you give up houses and brothers and sisters and land for the sake of the gospel, I will repay you a hundredfold in houses, brothers and sisters and land. And then he would jump to his ministry being the gospel. And he would say, if you give to this ministry, Jesus will repay you a hundred times. That's better than any bank would turn around here, you know? Praise God. Hallelujah. And if you notice all of these evangelists, they are very wealthy and they're separate and superior. So what they were doing back then is not new. And what we're doing now is not new. It's the default position of our egos that we call Satan. It is a way of getting us messed up about who we are. Jesus says, You've got to lose your life to find it. You've got to let go of that to find your life. Jesus knew his situation. He knew that he was talking to people about community and bringing people in community, and they were seeing themselves as separate and superior, and the fear was going to take over. He knew he, knew he was going to have to suffer and die at their hands. You can't challenge somebody like that in power and expect not to be hurt and suffer and we can't either because we are called to be different from that to go against that to look at it from a divine point of view that is a oneness part of you to, to let go of that sense of separateness and that sense of superiority and to meet each other at the bottom where Jesus is that's how you enter in relationships with each other. Not feeling superior and separate, but feeling at one. Richard Gore has an interesting way of putting this that I really like. He says um, that life is not about you, but you are about life. Life is not about you, but you are about life. You are an instance of that universal and eternal pattern that we call life. It is a, a receiving and a giving. We would call it an instance of love. It is a giving and receiving. And the myriad forms of life are not separate things from you. They are a part of the whole that we might call God. When we begin to see ourselves as a part of the whole, a part of each other, things change. We begin to live in gratitude rather than trying to climb the ladder and be better than others. Jesus says that what does it profit you to gain the whole world and forfeit your life? And life there is not the, the, the living life. It is the word soul. Gaining the world, all these external things, and lose your soul. You see, the ego doesn't want to recognize the soul. Satan doesn't want to recognize the soul. You've got to find it. And the soul is fed through meaning, through purpose. It is about finding your place in the world. 
that's why we give to the church not because we're going to get back in money in kind but because when we give sacrificially to the church it binds us to the community where our treasure is there our heart will be also it makes us a part of the community and in the community you're going to suffer but you're going to grow in your soul you're going to suffer because you're going to hurt people and people are going to hurt you but you're going to learn how to forgive you're going to begin to change the way you see life and change the way you understand people you see Abraham was promised a wonderful community Joseph another of our ancestors learned how to forgive Jesus brought that all together and allows us to see that holiness is that oneness that we experience when we see ourselves as a part of the whole and all we have to do is participate we don't have to do everything we just have to participate in it and that feeds our soul 